-hmm. So what's at stake in November in the US is democracy itself. And if that goes wrong, it's a much bigger threat to us than uh, NATO or, or the transatlantic ties. A very warm welcome to everybody in the room here, everybody who's lucky enough to obtain a ticket, um, and warm welcome to the viewers at home as well. Um, my name is Yuri Albert, I'm the director of Tabali, and I will try to moderate this evening. It's um, called Europe at War. And tonight we will discuss what kind of geopolitical actor Europe wants to be uh, in the light of the current conflict, uh, such as, of course, the war in Gaza and the war in Ukraine. And what is the EU global role and identity? We'll do this together with four, like I said, four excellent speakers, um, excellent because of their expertise and experience. Also, I'm very pleased uh, that we have around 15 students, I think, here uh, in the room from the UVA and uh, Paris 8, uh, the two universities, who were here the whole day discussing their visions on Europe, uh, where is Europe and where is Amsterdam. And we have also here in the front row the French ambassador, François Alabrune. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Ambassador, as well. We'll start uh, this evening by listening uh, to our uh, first uh, a guest, Frans Timmermans, here on the front row. I introduce him briefly, um, among many other things, uh, the political leader of uh, the GroenLinks Partij van der Arbeid, Green Left Labour Party. Um, before this, he was uh, ex vice president of the European Commission and um, involved with the European Green Deal and European Commissioner for Climate Action. He was Minister of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands. Uh, he was uh, in the second cabinet of Mark Rutte, who's in his last cabinet now, we think. And uh, uh, State Secretary of Foreign Affairs from 2007 to 2010 already, in the fourth Balkan and the cabinet. So he's one of our most experienced foreign policy makers, I would say. So we're very, very fortunate that we have him here tonight in this topic. Um, Frans Simmons, thank you very much. I will leave the floor to you. Um, warm welcome to you. A warm applause to Frans Simmons. <laughs> Yes, Yuri, you're not exaggerating when you're saying a warm welcome, because it's indeed quite warm here. Um, um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and especially uh, in the presence of so many important people, people who think about the future of Europe, people who write about it, people who have long experience in security policy, and especially young people who want to acquire that experience for themselves. And that's why the first thing I want to do is to take you back to the years I was studying in France, um, 84, 85, so right after the invention of the wheel um, uh, to, to the young people in, in the audience. And um, at the time we had a conference like this, very much about European security, uh, what's going to happen in Europe. It was, uh, keep in mind that only a couple of years before we were on the verge of an open conflict with the Soviet Union because Mr. Andropov thought that he was going to be attacked by NATO, and thanks to British intelligence, this was discovered, and then some exercises uh, were cancelled, which sort of uh, dropped the level of uh, anxiety in uh, the Soviet Union. So just two years after that, I was studying in France, and then the debate was about what's going to happen in Europe. And a colonel from the French army stood up, and he had a question, he said, if Germany is going to be unified, reunified, obviously it will not be a member of NATO. Obviously it cannot be uh, a member of the EU. We would have a neutral Germany at the heart of Europe. What does that mean for our security? And then as one woman and man, all the Germans got up, asked for the floor and said, what a ridiculous proposition. Germany reunited. Unthinkable. This is four years before it actually happened. So the lesson I learned as somebody who studied foreign policy is never think something is unthinkable. Um, at the same time, some of the same people who had said it was unthinkable after November 89 said, well, it was inevitable. It was inevitable. So people can go from unthinkable to inevitable with a bit of intellectual gymnastics, but this is what you see quite a lot in foreign policy, and I want you to, to keep that concept in mind. I had the same experience 
a couple of years later when I was a young diplomat in the first Soviet Union, then Russia, and because we had a military attaché in Moscow who loved to travel across the Soviet Union, had set the goal that he would travel everywhere, but uh, the ambassador, uh, you know, you need to know in diplomacy, there's always mild tension between the people from the Foreign Office and the people from the Defence Ministry. Um, uh, and I shan't elaborate on that a lot, but the ambassadors really like to know what their um, uh, military attaches are up to. So I was sent with him uh, to travel across uh, this Soviet Union. And I came back and I said to the ambassador, I want to write a report to The Hague. I think this place is going to fall apart. And he said, until then, I thought you were going to have a brilliant career in the foreign ministry. <laughs> but if you write that nonsense to The Hague, you'll end your career. And I'll not sign off on it. I will not do it. It's nonsense. And I asked him why. He said, well, it's not in their interest to fall apart. And by the way, it's also not in our interest. Um, and this is another wrong way of rationalizing foreign policy. It was not in the interest of the constituent parts of the former Yugoslavia to go to war with each other. It was not in the interest of the republics of the Soviet Union that they would fall apart. It was not the intention of Yeltsin to end the Soviet Union. He wanted to remove the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And in doing that, he actually killed the Soviet Union because he misunderstood that the Communist Party was a cement keeping together the Soviet Union, not state structures. But anyway, I don't want to go too far into that. But the, the other concept I want you to just keep in mind is that in foreign policy, many consequences are unintended. So get rid of the attitude, things are unthinkable. Get rid of the attitude, things are uh, unavoidable, because they're not unavoidable. And also lose the attitude that um, uh, people will always rationalize and countries and, and politicians act in their self-interest rationally and don't make decisions that take them in a different direction. I say this and now I want to move quickly to, to today. Uh, there's enough politicians reminiscing about the past. Uh, we need to look at the future. If I look at the geopolitical situation in Europe uh, today, um, we are at the end of a very, very long period of incredible economic growth because of incredible low interest rates, because of a huge increase in knowledge that helps the economy, because of a lot of political stability after the end of the Cold uh, War. Uh, a lot of things were going our way, and we started assuming this was the natural situation, the natural uh, 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 situation to be in. We now understand that this was an exceptional period, and that period has come to an end. So the challenges we face are a lot bigger. And I think this is part of the reason why many people in Western societies do not like to be confronted with that challenge and prefer being put asleep by a story about nostalgia, about the greatness of the past, that if you just choose the nationalistic way, you will recreate the greatness of the past and you will not be bothered with all the challenges of your future. It's a very, very dangerous um, way, this nostalgia, of avoiding the confrontation with reality. Nostalgia is like, like good wine. Wonderful, one glass, two glasses, I said in the presence of the French ambassador, especially French wine. But if you start drinking whole bottles, you'll lose your way. And this is what I see a lot in European societies, that people, people are living on a nostalgia that has nothing to do with the realities of today, let alone of tomorrow. So they fear tomorrow too much and are then tempted into a story about the past. And then, of course, if that story does not deliver, there's always someone you can blame. And mostly that's a foreigner, that's a person who's different, that's a person who has other ideas. And this dynamic in our society is causing a lot of harm, and I think it's high time we weaponed ourselves against this and uh, had the courage to face the future. Because although we have a lot of challenges, there's no reason why we should be afraid of the future, unless we abandon the choice to shape our future. Now, in the international arena, Obviously, um, uh, Putin's, I could talk about hours, hours about Putin, uh, whom I first met in, in Petersburg in, in, in 91, but shan't do that, perhaps for another evening. But he has, his calculation is 
that in attacking Ukraine and then creating an alliance with countries that all want to get rid of American dominance, um, he could actually bring about a change of course in Europe and he could create a permanent alliance with countries that all share one goal and that's get rid of the American influence or the American dominance. The countries he's aligned himself with very strongly, and you can look at the numbers, numbers of weapons, numbers of drones, numbers of technology, are essentially three. Iran, North Korea, and China. And all of them uh, uh, have essential contributions to his war effort in Ukraine. He could not maintain this war effort in Ukraine if he did not get the support from these three countries. At the same time, because his defense industry is churning out new stuff all the time, these three countries profit a lot from the defense knowledge he then gives back to them, creating also a stronger position for them in the international community, which is a direct challenge. If, if they challenge the Americans, I mean, it would be tempting for Europeans to say, well, it's no skin off our back. No, they challenge not just the Americans as a country. They challenge the values and the way societies are organized. They challenge open societies. They challenge the rule of law. They challenge democracy itself because they believe democracy is just one of the systems uh, that compete with more efficient systems such as, in their view, theirs. So if you want to analyze our potential in the coming years, you have to be aware of this dynamic between these four countries. That's the downside. The positive side is nothing binds them other than the wish to weaken the Americans and us. Because underneath that wish are a lot of contradictions. For the Chinese, it is wonderful. They were always dominated by Russia as big brother. Now they are the big brother. They, were always, they always suffered Russian racism in, uh, 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 towards them. They now see this as payback time. But there is no love lost, lost between uh, these two nations. I was, I was asked, so how, uh, by a, a minister in the Middle East, uh, in Saudi Arabia, how do, you, how do you assess China's position in this, in this war? And I said, well, China does not want the Russians to lose, doesn't really want the Russians to win. They just want this conflict to go on because it weakens all their potential uh, competitors. And he said, hmm, sort of what we did during the Iran-Iraq war. And I think that's the logic. If you, are, uh, uh, if, you are, if you pretend to increase your international position and two of your potential competitors are at war, you, don't, you say you choose sides, but at the same time, you're just trying to keep this going as long as possible so they, they are weakened and you become uh, uh, stronger. Now, what does this mean for the choices we have to make? I think first and foremost, it is of the essence that Putin does not win this war. I think I, I hope you understand if you've listened to what I've said until now. If he wins this war, it's not just Ukraine that will crumble. It's the very idea that the United States and Europe together are not capable of even defending their direct interest in their own neighborhood. And that will have a huge international effect that goes way beyond just Ukraine. And it's not just about the Russians then going after the Baltic states, perhaps Poland, especially in Central Asia, especially in the Balkans. Yes, they will do that. But the loss of position of the collective West in international relations will be even worse than these concrete measures taken. And the loss of position has a huge effect on those countries that today are more or less on the fence, but also because of the Gaza crisis, are now pushed towards um, those four countries I mentioned uh, before. The Gaza crisis, the Gaza war, is another contribution to this narrative which does find its way in the global south, that Americans and Europeans have double standards. Americans and Europeans have double standards. And this is, of course, exploited by our adversaries in China, in Russia, and elsewhere, in Iran. And it does make school in the global south. So 
if you, if you agree with me that these four countries, Russia, China, uh, Iran, and North Korea, for the time being, they are beyond our reach. They will stick together to try and weaken us. Then after that, you get a whole range of mid-sized countries of increasing importance, sometimes huge countries, who are on the fence, but looking towards them rather than towards us. Brazil, South Africa, Turkey, India, all countries, well, India, like Russia, profits hugely from imports from energy from Russia. But these countries are trying to make up their minds, where is our future? And we as Europeans, together with the Americans, would be well advised to try and find common ground with those countries before we lose them to this coalition against us. And I think the time we have for this is not very long. And I insist on one point, and I do it really in the presence of the French ambassador, because this is a message I would love to send to Paris. The disenchantment, disillusion, anger even of my friend Lula in Brazil, because we are not delivering uh, on the, the trade treaty, Mercosur treaty, that he was promised and he was hoping for, drives them also more in the direction of the Chinese. He didn't need much encouragement. He was already halfway there. But this is helping to not create um, uh, better relations with countries in, in Latin America. So I know trade policy today is very unpopular across the board. But we have to think about trade policy in terms of geopolitical interests. And we're not doing that enough. And this, I think, is very, very urgent. Also because the economy, industry, is changing at a pace which is breakneck right now. And factors contributing to the strengthening of our adversaries are, for instance, the transition, energy transition, which is sped up in, in India and especially in China in a way that uh, we haven't seen before. New technologies. Russians and Chinese are actively developing, uh, I find this extremely scary, actively de developing artificial intelligence for military purposes. Uh, and this, this could be a direct threat for us. The scale with which they are building drones, which is the new weapon on the battlefield uh, 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 between Iran and Russia is incredible. So, brings me to another factor which I want to address before I end. If we, if you agree with me that what's at stake in Ukraine is much more than just the freedom of Ukraine, but also Europe's destiny, Europe's future. We need to carefully study the battlefield situation in Ukraine because new military technologies, new military approaches, new military tactics are always formed very rapidly in war situations. And I think we need to be very clear in how we respond to those threats. What do we do with the new technology? What do we do with drones? Where do we invest? And I think in a, in a time where money is short and the economy is not booming as much as we hoped, we will have to start spending more on the fence than we have done for a long, long time. And most countries in NATO are struggling to reach the 2%. But frankly, I have to tell you, I'm not sure how long that 2% will be enough. And I think it is of vital importance that we start investing quickly, that we do it on a European scale, that we stop competing against each other in the defense industry, that we start creating European champions in the defense industry, and that we sort of focus on those parts of the defense industry that behold the future, which especially is linked to drones, to unmanned aerial aircraft, to new uh, types of ammunition, to communication, material, etc., etc. all these things that Tom Middledorf knows much more about than I do. But that is the challenge we face today. So my message to you is perhaps a tough one, but it's also lined with a lot of hope. If we understand the strategic importance of working closely with the United States of America, which might become a lot more difficult in November, but I hope not, if we understand that, that the United States Yes, they are competitors in certain economic areas. But for our security, they are essential contributors to our security. If we understand that, if we understand that Europe's destiny will be decided on the battlefields of Ukraine, much like it was decided 
more than 100 years ago at Verdun and elsewhere, if we understand that, then there's nothing that can stop us to make sure Ukraine comes out of this victorious and that we come out of this stronger. Our strategic depth is a lot deeper than what Putin has to offer, even though today it looks different. And I want to quote one of the biggest philosophers this country has ever uh, produced, uh, that's Johann Cruyff uh, from this city, who said uh, about the Italians, uh, they can never beat you, but you can lose to them. And this is what I want to say about Putin. He cannot beat us, but we can lose to him if we are divided, if the nationalists get the upper hand in more and more countries. Don't underestimate them. They all admire him. They're hiding it now, but once this war is over, and would he come out victorious, they're all his friends again. So we have to be very, very careful what direction we take, and the European elections are going to be crucial. I think in June, the center can hold in Europe. I think it can hold, um, unless the conservatives make the tragic mistake they've made in Italy, they've made in Sweden, they've made in Finland, they're making here in the Netherlands, of thinking they can neutralize the radical right by joining them. In all of these examples, whether it's Italy or Sweden or Finland, and I hope not here, but we're on the verge of that, the opposite happened. Once you align yourself as a conservative with a radical right, you will be eaten by them. And that brings me to, and then I'll end, to the definition of an appeaser, once given by the great Winston Churchill. An appeaser is someone who feeds the crocodile, hoping the crocodile will eat him last. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have to take a breath after your um, uh, uh, amazing speech. Thank you very much for your thoughts, uh, your insights. Um, I'm going to uh, ask two other people uh, at the table and introduce them, and we uh, uh, will look into your speech uh, a little bit more if we might. Um, I'm inviting uh, Natalie Tocci and uh, Rim Montas to uh, join me here at the table. And Welcome, both um, uh, journalists. Um, and uh, um, academics uh, on uh, international affairs. So it's wonderful to have you here. I think Franz was absolutely right. Um, it is, well, firstly, I think... Oh, I'm so sorry, you're totally right. <laughs> uh, well, understanding that what happens in Ukraine is integral to European security, uh, mm -hmm. I think, is of the essence. Um, I think that what is key is not only is it of the essence for European security, mm -hmm. what would happen to Moldova, you know, as, as opposed to the Baltics, as opposed to Poland, etc. Um, but the, I think the broader point that he was making is what does this say about us? Hmm? I mean, if this goes wrong, what does this say about us? And who are us in your opinion? Uh, my, my us is Europe. Hmm? Okay. Uh, what does it mm -hmm. say about us if at the end of the day we cannot stop a revisionist power, which, frankly speaking, is kind of a little bit, I mean, I mean, they're not that strong, right? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a declining demography, we're talking about a declining economy, we're talking about an army which, you know, in all fairness, has adapted, but frankly speaking, was not exactly the mighty force that we, we imagined. So if we lose to that, what are the global consequences of it? Now, my view and what I worry about a lot is the way in which, although in a sense we could have hmm, probably won this war already, I think we were scared of it. Scared to win it. I think we were scared to win it. Uh, I think that we've been paralysed by our fear. Not paralysed, because in fairness we did do a number of things and a number of very important things. Um, but every time, you know, especially if you go back to 2020... So you're uh, asking the question, what does that say about us? And you'd say, actually, uh, if we agree with Franz Timmermans, and you do, huh, but yeah. then uh, it says about us that we're afraid. I think that fear is a very important uh, emotion uh, that, in, that, that explains a lot of what we're doing and what we're not doing in Europe, whether mm -hmm. you're looking at it 
in terms of Ukraine, in terms of the Middle East, in terms of um, you know, uh, our inaction in Gaza, our uh, fear of migration in North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, our total paralysis vis-a-vis -vis the United States thinking, you know, what's going to happen if Trump comes? Are we even beginning to have the conversation about, I don't know, how we should coordinate about it? No, we're not. So total paralysis. And I think if you don't bring in fear as part of the equation, it's very difficult to understand what we're doing, what we're not doing. Now, on Ukraine specifically, I think fear has worked both ways in a kind of, you know, uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of predicament that we've put Ukraine in. When Ukraine does well, think about the 2022 uh, uh, Kharkiv yeah. uh, and Kherson offensive, yeah. then we were like, oh my God, shit, you know, nuclear Armageddon if they win and what happens if Russia implodes and all the rest of it. Then when Ukraine does badly, i.e. now, then we give it another patriot, another Samti, another... It, it, the cruelty of it, if you think of it, is incredible, right? I mean, you have to wait, what, for another attack in Kharkiv to give a patriot that was collecting dust in, in our own countries, preventing a war of, you know, so you're not quite sure when. I mean, the war is now. Um, so yeah, know, that's a, it's, it's a very strong point. So we're so afraid that we're afraid for the Russians to win and for the Ukrainians and for to win. lose. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. we, we don't want either, right? Yeah. And, and, and in a sense, that fear, which has kind of squeezed our action, is, I think, part of the reason why this war is actually uh, that is prolonging the war yeah, yeah. and therefore is increasing so the deaths our, our foreign policy our, our european foreign policy also von der Leyen uh, announced a geopolitical commission huh, yeah. when she when she started uh, um, is, is is shaped by fear look you know i think uh, i mean uh, yeah i mean we've done a lot i don't want to kind of overdo uh, this right not enough I mean, not enough, exactly. Um, I think that this is really a situation whereby if you look at it from the inside out, then you kind of pat yourself, or rather you pat, you know, others on, on the back saying, you know, sort of, you know, look at what we've done and defence was a dirty word in Brussels, or at least on one side of Brussels, and we've done a lot and the European Peace Facility and, hey, we're great and we've revived enlargement and we've hosted refugees and we've decoupled energetically from Russia, so we've done a lot looking at it from the inside out. The problem is that you, know, you kind of have to look at it the other way around. So what is the snapshot today? And the snapshot today is that Ukraine is losing this war. And as, as Franz was saying, this was a war, you know, this is a war for us, you know, it, 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 this is not an, uh, you know, it's a perfectly winnable war. I think we lack the imagination to see what's happening. We are too much stuck in the mold that we created when the wall came down and we thought that was going to be Europe from now on and we would slowly expand our stability to new member states, etc. We just lack the imagination at this stage to see how disruptive and dangerous Putin is. Mm. So you would say we're not, we're not afraid enough? I, I think we just, we just, it is what he wants to achieve to many, many people is still unimaginable. Mm. Right. People so still not, think, yeah, yeah. well, he'll, get, he'll catch Kiev and he'll That's stop right. there. Um, and and that, I mean, that is very much reminiscent of how parts of Europe, large parts of Europe treated uh, uh, Hitler when he started expanding. That's exactly the same phenomenon. So, 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 you, so you would say um, we lack the imagination of, you know, things can be so much worse, we can't imagine how, how bad they actually can be. Well, so we're not afraid and then, enough. And then we underestimate uh, the power we have to respond. We could respond right. much more strongly and put him in his place. He's not that strong. Exactly. Uh, but yes, he's got nuclear weapons, but he will not use the nuclear weapons. I'm quite convinced of that. But it's not that we're... The economy is the side of, size of Spain's economy. Right. Yes, he's got... He's, it's a big gas station, so there's a lot of gas to sell, and there's a huge amount of money uh, coming in. But we've lost so much time and given them the, and, and they've surprised me, frankly, their, their way of adapting in the military sphere is incredible and, and scary, frankly. But still, I don't see them as a mortal threat unless we let them be a mortal exactly. threat. And, and my, final, my final point is this. He has now, like Stalin, he has callously led probably hundreds of thousands of young Russians to their deaths. And he can do this because he controls the information, but this will have huge repercussions on Russian society quite quickly. 
And so, again, he's not that strong. Rim, Momta, thank you very much, both. Um, your first comment on... I mean, it's great because I kind of agree with what was just said. Very sad. Very sad. <laughs> well, but I think that's also what I want to get great at. It's also great. I think the thing that to me is very important, what you said, is talking about the changing of the world order and the changing context in which Europe and Europeans live in today. And I think on that level, there's a real disconnection with reality. Um, despite the return of reality in a very vicious way over the past two years. Um, there's a bubble of self-delusion that still exists, I think, in most European countries about the realities of the world, um, about what is required. And in where order. is this bubble in, in, in Europe, but in the heads of governments or the people or both? Or? I think in various ways mm -hmm. it's in both, mm -hmm. um, not in the same way. And not, by the way, to the same degree. So there are some policymakers who have completely understood that this is happening and, and have drawn the right conclusions, but are, have, having, are having a very hard time getting stuff done in order to uh, put in place the responses that are needed. I think also, uh, you know, in all of my conversations in settings like this, there's always people who are very upset when I start saying, you know, Europe was given an exceptional um, peace bubble for seven years, something... 70, that, 70, you mean? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Something that no other region in the world has ever benefited from. And that's the advantage that the rest of the world has over Europeans, which is that they have 70 years of experience ahead <laughs> on mm. Europeans in terms of dealing with uh, a world where power dynamics are king, where there there aren't a lot of rules where there are rules sometimes and the same rules don't apply in other places. And it's not just about a double standard. It's just about finding opportunities and kind of the law of the jungle in a way. Um, and that's something that I think Europeans need to really uh, be much more open to without falling into the defeatism or the pessimism of, well, this means that we're all just going to go to war again and we're all going to die and no one is going to live in peace anymore. That is not the message, because if that is the message, then we've already lost. Mm. Yep. And that's my second point, which is that I'm really struck by the crisis of confidence that Europeans have. Um, I think that too many Europeans don't believe in their own power, in their own agency, in their own ability to do things. Um, and you're right to say that the transatlantic partnership is very important and it is fundamental for European security. I would, I think, diverge with you on one point, which is that the change that is happening in the US now is not just Trump. Oh, no, no. Yeah. And it is bipartisan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not just Trumpism. It is not just Republicans. It is a generational shift. The, a, an important part of the younger democratic generation doesn't have the same connection and engagement and, and commitment to Europe that their elders had because they didn't go through the, the, the Cold War and because, to be frank, they grew up thinking of Europe as a fancy place to go have a vacation. Yeah, yeah. And so they don't understand in their minds why should Americans continue paying for the security and defense of these people who clearly have better health care, better infrastructure, more vacation time, better beaches than we do. Um, and that is a thing that comes up among Democrats, but also among Republicans. And I think that is something that people really have to, you know, just accept. It doesn't mean that you have to completely break the relationship with the U.S. I don't think that's the right thing to do. But the transatlantic relationship has to evolve Absolutely. and has to transform in a way that works for both sides. And I think we're very far from that. And until we resolve that together, Americans and Europeans, there is going to be this weakness, this latent weakness with the Western bloc. And I know that some in Europe don't like to talk in terms of blocs, but that is the way the rest of the world sees Europe and the US. And that, you know, you have to live with that reality. Can I, can I briefly respond yes, please. to this? Yeah. Because Luke. I fully agree with you. My, my fear in November is not the transatlantic time. My fear in November is the United States 
turning away from democracy, because that's what at stake in November. And that's a much, much bigger threat to us mm. than whether they want to, us to spend more on defense and they want to do less for European defense. I don't fear that, neither with the Republican, not even with Trump. But I do fear this, you know, if you ask a vice presidential potential candidate, will you respect the outcome of the election, they will not answer the question. Mm. So what's at stake in November in the US is democracy itself. And if that goes wrong, it's a much bigger threat to us than uh, NATO or, yeah. or the transatlantic ties. Yeah. I'm asking uh, uh, another guest at our table, um, uh, uh, General uh, Middendorp. Uh, Tom Middendorp, please, if you would join us. Uh, wonderful. I would like to. We are all born in peace here. We are raised in peace, and peace is for us, for us is a normal. It's and we are not used to work for our peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to relearn that. We are not used to, to do the dirty work to keep peace in our countries. And we have to relearn that. We are not used to invest in that. Uh, what our political discussions were about how to divide all the wealth that we have on social systems, educational systems, etc., etc. How to use the wealth, uh, but not how to protect it. And I think Ukraine, in that sense, brought us into the big world. Uh, and I think the EU really needs to mature. The EU has been a very internally focused organization, economically driven. Uh, there is a, an increasing political dimension to the EU, and, a, uh, and an increasing, there is also an enormous potential. Uh, but it has been driven by nation interests. Uh, and by more the economic side, and I think we need to create more synergy in Europe and also mature ourselves in, in, um, in how to act in this globalized world and in this more fragmented world that has been uh, discussed here at the table, uh, which means that we have to develop the, especially the foreign policy side. Um, what I've noticed, I've been involved in more than 20 missions all over the world. And whenever I... Yes, personally, yeah. Yeah, directly yeah. or indirectly. Yeah. I've yeah. not been in the fights but all everywhere, but <laughs> I've been responsible for them. And what I've noticed is that we, we only send military in a reactive sense when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are always reacting to things. Uh, and that, that's the first lesson we should draw to become more proactive. More proactive at, at reading the signs behind what's happening in Ukraine, behind what's happening in Israel. What do you mean with proactive? It sounds, um, uh, sounds good in a way, but it sounds also very scary. <laughs> Is there, should, should, should that mean that we should sort of actively go there and put boots on the ground? Or what, what is proactive? Well, proactive is, is not just military, mm -hmm. it's, it's a whole of government right. approach. So, yeah, right. uh, so proactive means that you, you assess the, the, the driving powers behind friction, behind conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for instance, we were fighting piracy in Somalia. Mm. For instance. The pirates we caught were poor farmers. Yeah. Who didn't have a choice. Who turned into being pirates. They turned into pirates because ground. of the droughts, yeah. because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The increasing droughts drove them away from the homelands. They, had, they couldn't find any work. They were desperate. And they, they found this alternative. Yeah. They didn't have a choice. So look after the and agriculture are, in Somalia. Yeah. And so they, we are putting and plasters mm -hmm. on a wound that is infected. Right. But we don't deal with the infection. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we are doing. So uh, I think we need to, to look beneath the surface of these conflicts and address these root causes in our foreign policy and to use all the instruments that we have, economic instruments, political instruments, diplomatic, military, to do that. And also the military can contribute here. We can build partnerships with, with different regions and countries to help them build this resilience and to avoid them from collapsing, to avoid them from sliding away. Maybe you, you have, maybe you have seen it, maybe you haven't, but uh, uh, Macron, Europe is in mortal danger. And he says, um, he says, among many things, but he says, uh, we need uh, now a new European security framework. Sounds French and so <laughs> sounds, um, <laughs> sounds uh, also uh, new. What, what you, would your reaction as, you know, as former chief of our army, a, a new yeah, well, reaction to that? I think to a, to a certain extent he, he is right. Eh? Europe is not capable of projecting force. Some countries are a little bit. 
and some countries can organize that, but Europe as a whole has no structure to do that, has no command and control facilities like the NATO has. Uh, so, uh, and, but we also wouldn't want to duplicate everything that NATO has. Uh, we are, we are dual-headed. Dual uh, we work both for NATO and the EU, most countries. Uh, so you have to find a way on how to protect our interests within NATO as much as possible, but also to uh, protect your own interests without the US when needed, uh, as an EU. Uh, and that part has not developed. The whole defense part of the EU is hardly developed. And there is a military staff, and they look at military contributions to foreign efforts, but it is very, very limited. And they have no authority at all over what's happening in countries. Mm. You want to chip in? Yeah, Maybe? I mean, you, you brought up President Macron and, and, you know, love him, hate him, think he's right all the time, think he's right half the time or never. What is striking is that, uh, what I don't get is that why aren't other Absolutely. European leaders standing up and making these grand speeches or giving a 17-page long interview to The Economist in which... That's the online version, but yeah. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. like the actual transcript. It's yeah. 17 pages long. Um, you And it's not the first time, by the way, every one of his long interviews is, is like this. Um, it's just interesting that he... He's not right all the time, and sometimes he makes things worse by, because of he, the way he says certain things. But at least he has the um, the credit of and the merit of trying to uh, create a framework, trying to create this new way for Europeans to exist in this new world. Um, and you know, he's kind of making it up as he's going. He's been doing it for seven years. Some of the things he's been saying have been remarkable remarkably consistent. This whole yeah. idea about That's architecture... something different in 2019 with in, in The Economist, totally different, but he's making it up along. So. Well, he did and he didn't. Mm -hmm. So on the architecture of security and the need to make to, to create a new architecture of security in Europe, aka the framework of security, he's been saying it literally from the first day he was elected. Um, you know, he's tinkered with it here and there, but it has evolved because obviously it has evolved with reality, and that's, I think, a good thing. Um, just like his position on NATO, I mean, thankfully he didn't say again that it was brain dead because he saw that it isn't brain dead. And he, I think, had the intellectual um, uh, honesty to say that had the US US not been led by Biden, but also not existed, Ukraine and Europe would have been in deep trouble in 2022. So, you know, he, he does have that intellectual honesty. Um, you also can't expect a president to just do a huge mea culpa like, like a normal person and say, oh, you know, I was really wrong about that. That's not going to happen. It's just not the kind of animals they are. But I, I just, it's just interesting that he constantly engages in this exercise, whereas no one else in Europe does. Mm -hmm. Like, where is the big, uh, you know, st strategic, intellectual, conceptual uh, speech so, that Schultz gave about Europe and how Europe, what is the European model for this new day and age? And if that happened, there would be a real conversation and maybe the Europeans could create this new model together. Right now, it just feels like he talks those who want to support him are like, yay, and then he has a hard time delivering. That's a problem that he does have. And then there's the others who are like, oh my God, can't he just shut up? Like, we're just going to put our heads in the sand and it'll go away. And I think neither is helping Europe. War is here? War is here? War is here. Our continent is at war. Yeah. I, mean, I think, I think, you know, for instance, on this issue of capability, I think the mistake, which in fairness, in fairness, was not just a European mistake, no, it was of course. also an American mistake, yeah. was somehow thinking, and maybe, look, maybe it was to an extent, much, much less even a Ukrainian mistake, in thinking that there would be a Ukrainian counteroffensive and there was a theory of victory behind it, not necessarily liberating every inch of land militarily, but liberating enough for it to trigger a political change in Russia. And that actually, therefore, if that theory of victory panned out to be true, it would not be a long, long, long war, yeah? And so that's why the orders at the beginning of the war weren't coming in. I think that the realization that if victory is going to come or if defeat is going to be avoided, it will come in a different way only really started sinking in 
six months ago. But I beg to differ. At the beginning, very, very beginning, like, you know, this, the, Putin and Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. I remember very clearly by uh, April, you had military experts saying, this, like munitions, start working on munitions, where no one is making munitions enough, do it. It took a year for politicians to start talking about munitions. That had nothing to do with the theory of victory. It had to do with incompetence and not wanting to listen to the military experts. You seem to be agreeing, Tom Millendorp. Yeah, we, uh, I think we, uh, we don't have the, the sufficient decisiveness and speed. Yeah. Uh, so we are just taking steps too little too late. Uh, we, uh, we announced and we agreed that we would deliver tanks and then we deliver a few tanks, not many, uh, a year later or a half a year later. And Putin is completely prepared for all those tanks that are coming. Uh, he has been preparing defensive lines for half a year. Well, then you can build a very big defensive line that is impenetrable for, for that few, the little force that you can produce. So uh, we are constantly lacking behind and we have to scale up. Uh, and that's what we, where we find it very difficult to do. Uh, we, we all say we need more ammunition, but no country wants to build factories to do that. Uh, who wants to build, who wants to produce uh, bullets? Uh, so we, we all recognize the need for it, but we don't want to take the burden. And, and that's, the, that's the mindset shift that we need. I do see it shifting, shifting slowly. I uh, also see the investors making a shift now towards, okay, it's not dirty to invest also in our capability to defend our economies and our interests, but that's, that's far too late for what's happening in Ukraine. Can I just add one thing? I think you're right that it wasn't just a European thing. The, the American play, I think, was a little different in the way that it hurt the Europeans. For the longest time, 60 years, you know, America wanted to be the main supplier of weapons to Europe. It's kind of part of the unspoken and very spoken sometimes deal underlying uh, European security. Um, and so the Europeans weren't prepared, didn't have the capability or the capacity even to scale up because, you know, part of their transatlantic bond is that they will continue buying these weapons in, uh, uh, f from the US. And then American politics happen <laughs> and you have seven months of delay that will be very difficult for the Ukrainians to make up. And I wonder if this episode should not push more Europeans to think Yes, we are very attached to America. America is a, a, a unique security partner, but we do need more European defense. And one shouldn't happen at the expense of the other. It should happen together. And that also requires a shift in mentality in DC, in the US, where American politicians need to accept that Perhaps Europeans will buy a little less, so they will create a little less jobs in Pennsylvania and Delaware and all these places. Um, but it will allow the US to do more in the Pacific where it wants to go while having a Europe that continues to be strong and prosperous and so support the American economy. And that is something that is still far away and difficult be, in the US. Indeed, it can be very complementary and the, the US get, get what they ask for. Yeah. Right? So they want Europe to be stronger and to be a stronger partner. That, that's what we invest in. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it also demands a change in our nations, in our member states. Mm -hmm because our defense industries are very fragmented. We have small industries, very national driven, uh, and we have many small factories, but we don't have a few big factories. Uh, so we need to consolidate our industrial base. Uh, and that's uh, something that's going on in the European Defense Fund and in the European circles now as a kind of an intention. Uh, but. Uh, that really needs to be stepped up. If we don't consolidate our industrial base, we will never be able to do this. I, and th yeah. that requires that we pull things to a more European level. Uh, and that's maybe the good thing of what, what we see happening at this moment, that when we are confronted with crisis, COVID crisis, Ukraine crisis, this cohesion becomes a bit stronger and there is more acceptance of mandates going to a European level. Mm. Uh, and I think we need to use that now, now that the window is open. But, but let me make the Italian point in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> now to do that in a context of war, uh, the only way of doing it is a lot, 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 lot more money 
at European level, mm -hmm. in the sense that the financial, institutional, regulatory incentives that were set up up until now, I mean, it's not like they produce nothing, you know, but they produce a sort of incremental change that maybe in 60 years' time would lead to a result. But the war is now. And so you need a shock to the system, and that shock to the system can only come um, through a lot of money, as in not 1.5 billion, but more like 100. Or so I think this so. Common is, lending, just say it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, a next-gen <laughs> EU-like fund for defence. You know, I don't see any other way of of doing this. You know, um, because the incentive set up so far, as I said. Would have would lead to if if ever that results well, in decades. Is, is that just conceivably realistic? This amount, and then we go to the public, back to the public. But is that if that's if what it takes? Would that be? Well, you know, it's it's back it is back to you know it becomes thinkable when you know the unthinkable becomes thinkable when you don't have an alternative. Listen, it became thinkable during COVID. Exactly. European countries understood, even the most frugal did, that the only way to recover for the European economy to recover was to do a common uh, a lending and debt. And I think. It's taking a little more time now, but yeah, eventually, hopefully. But if, if they don't come to this conclusion, then they won't have the ability to scale up. I mean, it is as simple as that. It's a it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much to partners for doing this. I'm very, very happy. To